Okay, in this section 1.4, we're going to talk about the normal curve, also known as the normal distribution, and then some ways in which the normal curve can get messed up, to use a technical term, the deviations from normality. So the normal curve is an extension of the frequency um, distribution we looked at before, known as the histogram. Or it also, you could think about it just as the line graph that would um, connect the tops of these different um, columns. It's um, a hypothetical distribution in that it tells you what the distribution should look like if the sample were infinite. In other words, here it's kind of bumpy, but if we had an infinitely large sample on some distribution of, say, IQ or self-esteem or um, a uh, heart rate, a whole wide range of variables should distribute normally where we have um, uh, a symmetrical distribution and that your uncommon scores that are extreme um, are less frequent and the scores in the middle are more frequent and you have this standard kind of pattern called the normal curve. Later we'll see how this provides the basis for testing hypotheses um, and it also allows you through z-scores to um, provide percentiles for different scores on the, the normal curve. So here we're going to take a second and just use a, a web uh, Java application to get you to see how the normal curve comes about um, in real time. A simulation of a normal curve being formed um, and you have uh, balls being dropped here and bouncing left or right at these different rows and consequently either going to the um, the left or right or somewhere in the middle. And one way of thinking about this is the balls can um, either go left or right at each juncture and so it's going to tend to be that most of them kind of end in the middle with the left and rights bouncing out. But in certain situations you can have everything go right so to speak and somebody ends up way here say with a high IQ or everything go not so well and end up over here with the low IQ. But it suggests that there's a number of factors that are determining uh, the score for any individuals and that all those combined factors produce this normal sort of curve. So I paused for a moment there to let this fill in a little bit more and you can see it's it's approaching that normal curve we'd expect which is the black line which is just the ideal that uh, we would think this would um, start to approach, um, but that there are slight deviations here from it. It's not perfect, and that's because the sample is not infinitely large. Remember, the normal curve is based on an infinitely large sample uh, where all these little differences would, would balance out. So the key takeaway here, there's many factors at work, typically in systems that are going to produce a normal curve. And you can think about each row as being a different factor. If this were IQ, maybe um, one kind of genetic factor, another kind of genetic factor, an environmental factor for young uh, babies, the kind of cognitive stimulation they get. Here might be um, how loved they are and all the other things that might eventually filter into affecting um, someone's IQ level. Okay, so let's work through uh, another way of thinking about this one, a little less abstract, more um, concrete and something you might be familiar with, SAT scores. So we know um, when we take the SAT course and administer it to all um, students seeking to go to college, that what you're doing is you're pulling a sample out of the population of all possible scores and that you're assuming it's going to come in as a normal distribution and it's going to be set up so that 500 is the average score and then um, scores go to the left or the right. In other words, we're going to expect a large proportion of the scores to fall between 400 and 600. That would be the central tendency that we're experiencing. And then um, you're going to have variability running from 200 to 800. And um, we'll get to this later, but um, you can think about this in terms of standard deviation units um, and basically here the plus three marks that, that represent 200 and 800 are going to be very extreme and, and show up just a small percentage of the time. So again extreme scores are on the, the ends and this will the idea of extreme scores will be important to the logic of hypothesis testing which we'll get to um, later on. 
Okay, so looking ahead, um, you can have raw scores and standard scores. So raw scores, as I'm indicating here in red, are the SAT, ACT, and female height, and you could come up with an infinite number of other ones where you have specific scores in a specific metric. So inches, ACT points, SAT points, where they're expressed in the way you measure that construct, and you can see what those scores would be and how they relate to the normal curve. You can also calculate a standard normal curve where you standardize things so that one standard deviation represents one major jump up in variability, two standard deviations, three standard deviations, but here we have a special curve where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is equal to one. Uh, I realize we haven't got to standard deviation yet, so this will make more sense eventually, but uh, you can imagine that uh, it's important um, or it is important, excuse me, uh, to understand that 68% of scores are going to fall between negative 1 and positive 1. That's just a mathematical fact that we'll get to in a little bit. Um, and then um, also we can say that 95% of scores approximately are going to fall between negative 2 and positive 2 standard deviation units. So I'm, I'm saying this largely just to help you see how this can be useful in an applied sense. So if you're running a shoe store and you want to know what shoe sizes to carry, you um, can think in terms of the normal curve. So let's, and I'm making these up, but I think they're roughly right. Um, men's shoes, most people, 68%, are going to fall between 8.5 and 11.5 in shoe size. If you're willing to carry down to a size 7 and up to a size 13 for men, you're going to capture 95% of the population. So my brother, who's taller than I am, is just beyond freakish. So I'm at a 13, he's up at the 14, 15. I can find shoes in normal shoe stores, he can't, because he's in such an extreme part of the distribution that the stores say it's not worth stocking inventory for such a small segment of the market. And so they're just going to cover normal people. Um, that fall in the 95% range here. And if you're past that, you're going to have to go to a, a big and tall store or maybe even go down to kid sizes over here. So another way of saying the same thing, um, this is from uh, Wired Magazine a while back, talking about the difference in terms of how Internet companies can exploit more parts of the market than uh, brick-and-mortar stores. So if you think about it, Walmart is in that situation where they don't want to carry every last thing that you might want to listen to because the inventory costs, the cost of just keeping it on the shelves would be too high. But a music service provider on the Internet like Rhapsody or um, iTunes or whatnot, they can afford to have the full distribution there because they can... Um, sell stuff across the entire country, across the globe, and they can make it profitable to carry a very small um, inventory in some of these more esoteric, um, less popular forms of music. All right, moving ahead, I uh, want to give you just a quick snapshot of the logic of hypothesis testing that will become so important later on. Um, if we understand that we're pulling scores, say, out of the population, again, we're going to use SAT scores, you're assuming you get this kind of distribution. And let's say if you're looking at a specific score like 750, you can make one of two guesses about where that's coming from. You can say this is a normal person coming from a normal population with a mu of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. Or you can entertain another hypothesis that it's really a special person coming out of a special population. Maybe these are kids that have had a special tutoring program or they've had some kind of special advanced training or something that makes them fundamentally different than the normal population in that you're going to expect higher scores. And the, what you're doing is positing, in other words, you're imagining another distribution that this score might come from that is going to be um, of a higher mu than this 500 is for this one. So maybe the mu of this distribution is 700, and then it says that this 750 is not extreme if you're understanding it comes from a different population, where overall maybe the mu, as I'm showing you here, is higher at, um, at 700 compared to 500. So the bottom line that you want to keep in mind for as we get 
later in the semester into the topic of hypothesis testing. If a score is very extreme, we might include we might conclude that it comes from a different population. So if it's extreme, if it's near the tails, you might start thinking that score comes from a different population. Okay, then the last thing to talk about in terms of normality are the deviations from normality. And you might be saying, I know what it's like to be a deviant. I have a brother who's not normal. No, not, we're not talking about that kind of uh, just loopiness um, that you might describe your brother as in terms of deviation from normality. We're talking about deviations from the normal curve. So um, there's three primary ways. One would be skew. And as you can see here, skew has uh, uh, a, a situation uh, where the data are no longer symmetrical. So the curve leans one way or the other. So if it's positively skewed, that means you have some extreme scores over here on the positive end. And if it's negatively skewed, you have some extreme scores on the negative end. Now, folks routinely get these confused. Remember, it's not where most of the scores are that defines the skew. It's where the extreme scores are. So it's the tail that tells the tail of whether it's positive or negative. Kurtosis has to do with the variability of the scores. So if the scores are really spread out so that they're flat, like this blue line here, that means that the distribution is platycurtic. That's high variability. And just for your um, education here, I have a picture of the flat-billed platypus, um, which has the same plat um, root, meaning flat. OK. And then mesocurtic is what a normal curve looks like. So that's what we would expect uh, normally. That's red. But if there's really low variability, in other words, see how this is a smaller range of scores between left and right in the green distribution? Then you're going to get this pointy thing. That means it's leptocurtic. So kurtosis has to do with an abnormally low or high amount of variability. And then last, modality is when you have two distinct humps, two distinct parts of um, or two distinct distributions that kind of get blended together so that there's not one middle point that's highest. So this would be my bimodal. You could also have trimodal, quatrimodal, etc. So, <clears throat> so here we have um, some examples of deviation from normality just for you to practice a little bit. So if you'll hit pause just for a second and then uh, you can try to describe the um, kinds of deviations that you see here. Okay, welcome back. Uh, taking these in turn. Um, this is uh, some data we have from a um, central warehouse and how long it takes to retrieve certain kinds of parts. So what this might suggest is that there's two fundamental distributions. There's certain kinds of parts that you can get pretty quickly, and there's other kind of parts that take a while to get. So maybe some are stored in one warehouse, some are stored in another warehouse. But if it's bimodal, it's suggesting that something funky is going on where there's a major source of variation that's actually uh, causing it to be two distributions rather than one. And when you blend them together, that's when it looks bimodal. OK, so going down here, we have a distribution of, of ages up to 70. Very few on the young end, and then a bunch out here. So the tail tells the tail over here. These scores on the left, that means it's um, a distribution that's um, negatively skewed. And we'll get to this in the next unit, but um, it affects the measure of central tendency that you want to use. The mean, our most common measure of um, averageness or central tendency, uh, becomes a little less accurate when there's data that are skewed. And we'll find out that it's better to use the median. Uh, it better tracks the, the central part of the distribution. And All right. And here we have another distribution where it's here we have another distribution where there's um, age represented on the x-axis and then count. And you can see this is a, the opposite situation here. It's skewed, but it's now skewed in the other direction, where the, there's positive scores out here that are few in number, but that are skewing it. Um, and the bulk of the scores are down here. So this would be an example of positive skew. And then let's assume down here you asked a number of people how they felt about net neutrality. And for whatever reason, there's just a huge variability of scores. So here we're showing low variability, excuse me, a wide variability um, in that the scores are all spread out and you don't have that normal tendency of scores being um, bunched up in the middle. So this would be platycurtic. 
All right, that's it for the normal curve and deviations from normality. Next up, we'll do a little bit of math review, which will set us up for the concept of standard deviation.